Thank you very much for joining us today, George Dunn of Giani Metals, to discuss um, the particular supply chains around manganese and their project in Botswana. George, what um, do you want to discuss with us today? Hello, Jabin. Um, what we'd like to discuss today is uh, essentially the positioning of, of small mining companies in the transition supply chain. Um, so, uh, as, as you said, I'm, I work for a company called Giani Metals. We have a portfolio of manganese projects in southern Botswana. We're developing these projects to produce a particular battery grade chemical that will be used in EV, in the construction of EV batteries. So we produce a, a commodity called uh, high purity manganese sulfate monohydrate. Um, this is a precursor chemical which will go into the construction of a cathode for a lithium ion battery. Um, so anybody who's familiar will sort of be aware of things like NMC chemistry, so nickel, cobalt, manganese, uh, which are the sort of um, the, the majority of, of EV batteries used at the moment. So just like nickel, just like cobalt, uh, just like lithium, just like graphite, high purity manganese is, is a battery chemical. Um, and like a lot of these other sort of uh, precursor materials, the, the processing, uh, so taking it from, uh, from the ore, so as you kind of see in the picture behind me, that, that's what a sort of a manganese ore body might look like, but taking that uh, through to the, the production of a high purity battery grade chemical, most of that is still done in China. So about 90 to 95% of all the processing capacity for manganese to produce this high purity sulfate form comes out of China. Um, and outside of China, there's actually really only one company that, that is in commercial operation. So we're looking to be only the second uh, such company to be able to take ore uh, and produce a battery grade chemical that can then feed into the transition industry as being part of the supply chain for, for the, the large automotives looking to, to increase their EV supplies. Excellent, sorry. Um, well, I, I, I like what you're saying, because, of course, it immediately feeds into the, the, the notion of diversifying the, um, you know, the supply sources for these critical minerals for the green energy transition, which is a key part of, you know, the critical minerals agenda, both in the EU and the US. And how do you think your, your project features in, in that sort of wider um you know issue and and more importantly where do you see a possible ripple effect both at the national level and perhaps even wider um so you know there, there's been a a huge drive recently particularly by you know, la, uh, by by the eu uh, the us you know sort of large company large countries looking to uh, be able to sort of start decarbonizing their their industries and obviously the transportation industry has been a particular focal point um and so you know where a company like us fits in obviously we're producing a material that will go in to this uh, ev transition um but also we provide a valuable source of diversification away from kind of essentially the dominance that china has so not only is this obviously sensitive from an industrial standpoint, so our kind of customers who might be the likes of a Tesla or a VW or a Ford, you know, they obviously have big concerns around their supply chain security uh, when when faced with any sort of uh, you know part of their chain that that is dominated by a particular country or a particular provider, they're obviously looking for for additional sources. Um, but there are sustainability issues as well. Uh, you know, they are being very he heavily regulated. Um, and so they must be able to provide, you know, uh, certainly now a, a larger degree of due diligence, um, more sustainability around their supply chains. And it's harder to enforce that when you don't have total transparency. And typically, you know, getting good quality data, getting good due diligence out of China is very difficult. You know, it, it, it's very much geared towards their own domestic industry. And as it pertains to a country, uh, to a company like ours, you know, we, we are looking at a particular process route to produce our product, which is very sustainable and low carbon. So we're going directly from our ore straight to, to the battery, method, battery chemical. 
most of the industry doesn't do that. It goes through an alternative route where um, it requires electro refining. It also requires the use of some quite toxic uh, chemicals like selenium. If they're not treated and then handled and stored safely, they can be very dangerous. Um, now, that's a big challenge, obviously. If, you, if you're now asking for vast quantities of new materials like ours, which the, uh, you know, which the EV industry is going to be doing over the next few years, how do you meet those two challenges of making sure you source material, first of all, but then making sure that it is sustainable? And if it's coming from perhaps a, a, an older, more traditional source using less sustainable routes, how do you kind of push that change through whilst not making it uneconomic for the for the producer? So new entrants like ours, there's an opportunity there for the, the end users to not only diversify, but also improve practices and start to feed in these sustainability hurdles you know, into our uh, into our production processes. So we are transparent because we're a listed company, we're listed on the TSXV in Canada. Obviously, we have to put out a large amount of disclosure. We have a website. People are free to, to come and view our project whenever they like. Um, so we're, we're a good opportunity for them to be able to improve the quality of their supply chain. But it also puts a huge amount of, um, it, it puts a huge burden on us in terms of having to bear all of that as a small company. And in terms of kind of the, the ripple effect, um, you know, this is the, the the critical metals, so those that are going to be used in this energy transition and this decarbonization, these are particularly, you know, usually not materials that were particularly well known or, or you know, or, or in high demand before this. Uh, I mean, manganese, the vast amount of manganese is used in the steel industry, just the same with the nickel is used in the copper, used in the stainless steel industry. Um, you know, cobalt didn't have a huge number of uh, practical uses, sort of nor lithium before before this, uh, this transition ar uh, arrived. So now all of a sudden uh, economies and countries are looking at these new opportunities. So you know, Botswana, uh, we're lucky that Botswana is a, a very well-run and very mining friendly environment because from independence, they've had a joint venture with De Beers um, to, and the Debswana joint venture where they've been, the, the government itself has been involved in the mining industry for decades. So they understand it. They know the difficulties that small mining operations face. The legislative framework there is, is very well understood and the communities understand mining because obviously it's a big employer and it's a huge contributor to GDP. But over reliance on any one commodity is, is always dangerous. So the government is very, very keen to diversify, obviously very keen to, to try and pivot into new opportunities. And they very clearly identified the battery industry as being something they can pivot to because they have resources of things like manganese, uh, as well as nickel, copper. So there's huge support that we see um, you know, at, a, at a local level for our project because it's part of the government's agenda to try and diversify away from precious stones. Um, and it can help lead a chain within there um, whereby, for instance, we can push for more renewable power to be part of the overall energy matrix. And the understanding that we have and the, the knowledge base that we develop in, de in putting together the processing capacity to get it from the ore to the actual chemical, um, which is in itself a new element for most mining companies to have to navigate. If you can capture that, then you can export that knowledge base anywhere. Um, you know, Botswana sits very close to South Africa, obviously, you know, as its, uh, as its next door neighbour in South Africa has an extremely well-defined hydrometallurgical, pyrometallurgical, you know, and mining technical, uh, technical resource, which it exports around the world. Well, this is an opportunity for countries like Botswana to seize that kind of IP and be able to export that as well. That, thanks so much, George. I mean, what I'm hearing from you is that effectively a small company is currently breaking some barriers which could then have you know knock on positive impact um, for other projects and the the region widely as well as the supply chain um, i think my my last question for you will focus on on just that which is to what extent do you think that this is being understood, valued, and recognized by the ecosystem um, around a company like yours? Is this necessity of 
you know, for small companies to sometimes have to reorganize how they work and, and how they connect to their market. Is that something that's currently well recognized and understood? Uh, I'd have to say no, um, it's really not. Um, and, uh, and I'd say it's, it's all the way through the industry. So we, uh, even, even ourselves, I think that it's taken us a while to really understand the fact that we are, we are not a mining company. We're more of a processing or chemicals company. The mining part of our business is actually very straightforward. Um, the deposit is not challenging, it's high grade, which means that it's not an awful lot of tons that we have to come out of the ground to process. The challenge is that we are looking to build and operate a, a chemicals plant, the likes of which really there's only one other example outside of China. And we're not using Chinese technology. We're not uh, looking for them to come in and build the plant for us. We're doing this all ourselves. So that in itself is a huge burden for any small company to, to manage because you know we, we have a 50 million US dollar market cap. The market treats us like an authentic exploration or pre-development mining company. So we carry still quite a lot of technical risk, which means that our profile only really fits a particular type of investor, you know, somebody with a large risk appetite looking for a high return. Um, and that understanding of what we really are, and this, this, doesn't, this doesn't just apply to us, it applies to an awful lot of small companies now looking to go into the battery space where uh, you know, unless you're a lithium company and you're mining, a, you know, spodumene concentrate that you'll look to sell off, that, that you'll look to pass on to a processor. What the industry is asking of us is we don't want people continuing to feed the Chinese processing machine. We want them to develop their own processing outside of China. So we want you guys not just to be mining companies. We want you to be chemical companies. But at the moment, we're treating you just like other mining companies. So until you have a minimum amount of documentation, technical documentation, you can give us like a feasibility study, you know, or some kind of, uh, you know, example of product production, um, then I'm afraid there's nothing we can do for you. You're just a high risk exploration company. Once you get those things, well, there are certain pockets of capital that you can access, but even those require quite a high level of technical understanding or, you know, a, a higher, the normal appetite for risk, bearing in mind that we're looking to produce a product that is a consumer commodity. It's not, you won't find the price listed in the LME. You won't really find any price visibility at all. So how do you take a, uh, how do you take a view on our revenue generation potential, our ability to navigate the supply chain? Um, so the industry itself is, is, is still not really appreciative of what companies like us are are going to be asked to do, how we're going to finance ourselves um, and, and how the kind of structure revolves around us. And, you know, you, you uh, very vocal sort of advocates like Elon Musk are around saying, you know, there's a problem with the mining industry, there's a problem with lithium supply, lithium prices are crazy and all this. And he's right. And there's, you know, some in the mining industry get a bit defensive about, well, he doesn't understand mining, but that might not be the point. The point is that at the moment we've got the same kind of investors who look to invest in base metals or precious metals, you know, which are very well understood, you know, with a long legacy of, of development and success. Now asking to come into an industry where the commodities are not very well understood, the processing, processing is definitely not understood, um, and the actual sales mechanics are not understood. So there's, a, there's an element to which we are facing, you know, difficulties with our own investors. Um, and the, the industry and the structure of the finance industry as a whole, they layer on top of that, that, that we are trying to sell a particular commodity where we're only looking to sell high purity manganese sulfate. That can only really go to the battery industry, which means selling ultimately to the car companies. Do they understand what they're asking of us? Do they understand when they're passing down this legislation and this, essentially sitting back from it? that we're going to have to, you know, we're going to have to take that on ourselves, a small company like us. And I think there's a perception that, that mining, you know, when people think about mining, they think about big operations, they think about the Rio Tintos and BHPs. The Rio Tintos and BHPs will struggle to get involved in the battery industry to any great degree, unless there are big resources there that they can really tap into. A small project like ours isn't big enough, really, to attract any interest. So it's going to be the smaller end of the market that has to take this on. Um, so at the moment, I think it's, it, 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 will be a, it will be an evolution, just as we're learning, 
what we are by nature now, that we are being asked to take on this processing leg that we never had before. And we'll be the first mining company in Botswana to, to, to process a finished product in country. Everything else you know, tends to be concentrates or stones going out for polishing, refining elsewhere. We're the, going to be the first mining company to actually produce a finished product that will go directly to customers straight into their cathodes. So, so this is something different for, you know, for the, um, the country that we're working in as well. So there's going to have to be this evolution. There's going to have to be this broadening of understanding. And it needs to happen pretty fast because, you know, the, the volumes that are being asked of battery companies like us, battery developers, are vast. And the amount of time taken to, uh, you know, to, 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 to start mines, to start processing, so to, to do your test work, to do your verification, um, I think there's still this, this lack of... Um, lack of appreciation you know and anyone starting a project like ours now you will struggle to be in production before 2030 um, so when you think about the demand that's coming on over the next five years and the fact that no one else really starting to develop a project like ours now will be able to feed into the next five years that's that's something which i think a lot of the industry doesn't really appreciate thanks george for illustrating so clearly how necessary mining is to the transition, but also the real change in mind frame and, and mechanics around the industry and all the way down the supply chain for, for mining to be able to play that role. So thank you very much for discussing that with us today. And we look forward for more great news from Guiani Metals. Thank well, you. Thank you very much, Ludwig. Thank you for thank inviting you.